Hi. This presentation was developed for the Control and Sensing Systems Unit of the Combined Electronics Framework at Bournemouth University. It's the first part of the section on stochastic processes in a sequence of short videos to support the unit studies in robotics, and in particular the work on Kalman filters. The emphasis of the whole section is on the statistics required to get started on the Kalman filter, essentially discrete zero-mean Gaussian white noise processes and the covariance matrix used for state-space system models. This first short clip introduces the basic ideas behind the topic. Namely, with what a stochastic process is before progressing to look at random variables and probability. So, starting with some terms and definitions, a stochastic process is a noise signal whose amplitude at any time is a random variable, that is, a random number drawn from some probability distribution. Now, noise exists in all sensors and electronic components in various ways. For example, at the very basic level, any conductor has free electrons or charge carriers which jiggle and move around the crystal lattice of fixed atoms under their thermal energies with this sort of Brownian motion, though they're quite a bit smaller than this. At any one time in the conductor, these motions will produce more carriers in one half than in the other, producing a noise voltage, V, which can be picked up on the sensitive voltmeter. The time record of this voltage will trace out a noise or stochastic signal. The amplitude and frequency characteristics of the signal depend on the physics of electromobility in the material. So noise is always present in electronic circuits from this and from other sources. We are particularly interested in the noise and uncertainty arising from sensor measurements, especially those associated with robot localization and navigation. Mistuned, and indeed some tuned in radios, can produce noise. Imagine setting up lots of identically mistuned radios of the same loudness in some hopefully distant field. We might want to measure how loud this is, if only to complain about it, but the loudness of the signal will vary differently from instant to instant on each radio. We could, however, try to take an average to get some idea of the overall intensity. And one way we could do this is by taking an average for one radio over a period of time. But for this number to be representative, the signal statistic shouldn't change if a different time period is chosen. In this case, the signal is said to be stationary. That is, although the intensity of the signal varies from instant to instant, its average value, or whatever other statistical measure we're interested in, does not change. Alternatively, however, we could take an average at one particular time over the whole range of the radios, the whole ensemble of signals, as it's called. For this to give the same result, the statistics of all the radios must be both stationary and the same as each other. And then, these are described as ergodic processes. It's absolutely convenient for us to assume that our noisy signals are both stationary and ergodic, so that we can take representative statistics from a single record in the time domain. An issue arising here is that stochastic processes can be continuous signals, like analog radio noise, or they can be made up of a discrete sequence of sampled random variables. We'll be using a computer to design algorithms using software packages like MATLAB, and then we'll be using some form of digital processor to implement them in real time. Either way, we'll be dealing mostly with discrete rather than continuous signals. Our A to D converters must sample often enough to capture the wiggliness of our signal. That is, the sampling frequency we use will determine the range of frequencies we can capture, and hence the characteristics and time response of our sampled signals. The best we can usually do is to use a sufficiently small sampling interval, that is a high enough sampling frequency, to capture all of the important frequencies for our system, so that from a distance we can pretend that the sequence of thin sampling rectangles approximates to a continuous signal. The noise signal amplitude at any instant is a random variable. Focusing on a time of 100 seconds, say, on the slide, 
the random variable x is actually sampled as having a value of around 2.8. But as a random variable, it could have taken any value between the limits here of around minus 1.3 and plus 4.8, and maybe beyond. The range of values it can take, and the probability it will be at any one of these, is represented by its probability distribution. So a random variable is one which represents the outcome of some non-deterministic process. We don't know its actual value until we have received a measurement or a sample. The range of values it can take and the probability with which it can take those values is described by a probability distribution we'll look at in the next clip. These are some examples of random variables. We're most interested in the sensor readings for robot location, but a good place to start is the probability involved with the traditional rolling of a fair die. If we are staking money on the outcome, we might be interested in the odds or probability of our number showing up. Unfortunately, probability is a touch contentious with several different interpretations. From an engineering perspective, the safest one is the relative frequency view, where we undertake an infinite number of trial experiments and count the number of times our number shows up as a percentage of the total. Unfortunately, taking an infinite number of experiments could take longer than we've got time for, so practically our best guess is to take as many as possible. An alternative is to take the classical approach and to consider how many outcomes favour our required result against the total number of equally probable outcomes. This one is a bit dodgy on logical grounds in assuming that each outcome is equally favourable or probable as it's logically suspect to define probability on the basis of equal probability. However, it is absolutely convenient as long as we keep in mind the equal probability assumption behind it. For example, we might bet on rolling a 3. Now using the relative frequency definition, after throwing the die little n equals 600 times, maybe while waiting for an answer from some call center or other, we might count 95 threes, say. So our probability is, the probability of three, is little n x at 95, divided by little n 600, equaling 0.158. Perhaps if we throw 6,000 times, we might get a more accurate result of 990 threes, which divided by 6,000 gives us 0.165. And after six zillion throws, we might get nearer the result that P3 is 0.167. But if we use the classical approach, we must consider the number nx of the outcomes which give our result divided by all possible outcomes. In this case, big nx equals the one outcome of the number three, and big n equals the total of six equally probable outcomes, giving Px is one over six or 0.167 roughly 16.7% of the total number of throws. Which is fine, as long as the die is not loaded and the thrower has average luck, so that all of the possible outcomes are indeed equally probable. Also, notice here that the probability is measured as a positive number somewhere between zero for no chance and one for a certain outcome where the number three is on every face. So now, having looked at some of the background to stochastic processes, random variables and probability, we can go on in the next section to look at how probability distributions relate to the amplitudes of a stochastic signal, and in particular, the Gaussian zero-mean noise signal.